Welcome back to Switched to Linux. Well, today we're going to solve a problem that I have had in the van, but there are many other wide applications for this, so it might be something you want to keep around. This is, of course, utilizing our Raspberry Pi. Now, in the previous videos, a previous tutorial, I think I did it about a couple years ago or so, I talked about how to create a wireless access point with a Raspberry Pi. This would take your Pi, plug it into your router with the Ethernet port, and then broadcast from the wireless chip in the Raspberry Pi another wireless access point. So if you're running Cat6 cables through your home network, you could put this guy in one room that you might use your computer in, but it's far enough away from the router, and you can have good internet. Now, in my current setup, in a small van, I don't exactly have a situation where I have places my wireless internet doesn't cover for obvious reasons. But my thought is, can we reverse this? Here's why. Now let me tell you my reason and then I'll tell you the reason you might wanna do this as well. My application is I have a really good internet system but I'm limited at 150 gigabytes in a month. But I oftentimes am going to stores or other places in the city, restock my supplies. Sometimes I'll just work from there as I'm getting some things done. And these stores generally have wireless. Now, I do not have most of my setup designed to use wireless at all. In fact, I don't find wireless to be a super good secure method, and so I tend to like having everything tied into my gigabit ethernet network built into the van. But what if I am at a Walmart shopping center, for example, and there's a dozen fast food places there, and they're all broadcasting their wireless and saying, hey, use our internet. That's what it's here for. So can I take this Raspberry Pi, borrow their internet, and feed my full network with this device? Well, it turns out you can. Nearly every tutorial you're going to find on the Raspberry Pi is the first way I've described the one I also have done a tutorial on, creating the wireless access point but here we're going to reverse it. Now, why might you want to do this? Well, if you're in a situation where you really need your internet to always be on, maybe you have a home network and you're worried about your internet going down, you can keep this guy laying around, plug it into your network, and then when your internet goes down, boot into this and you can still feed your home network on a cellular setup. Maybe you're building an off-grid cabin somewhere. This is a great way to have a good way to put your internet there and then feed your whole network with it because you might have a simple wireless hotspot. You might have a phone that you can hotspot your data from. These are all good applications that you would have for this type of setup. And so uh, I looked around and scoured the internet and I only found one guide to this. It was pretty old. There were a few different typos in it, but nevertheless, it gave me the starting point to work. So we're going to take that concept we're going to fix the typos in it. And the next thing we're actually going to do is we're going to install the ability to use VPNs on this because if I'm using public Wi-Fi, I need to secure my connection with a VPN. Now, if I'm using my phone hotspot or a separate wireless hotspot device that I have that I own and control, I'm not as concerned about that. But if I'm using this to borrow Subway's internet, for example, you know what? I want this guy connected to a VPN. So we're gonna add that onto the VPN stack. So now what our network will look like is our Raspberry Pi is gonna grab a wireless signal that's free floating through the shopping plaza. We're going to borrow this signal. We're going to pour, forward the internet to the ethernet port, feed the ethernet port into my router on the WAN port on my router. And then this is going to provide free internet for my whole setup here. And uh, that's what we are going to do. Now, because of a lot of different moving parts in this project, what I'm going to want to do is I actually built this with the full desktop environment for Raspberry Pi because I need to have a couple different terminals open to connect and get all my VPNs working, a few other checks. I want to have a, a full operating system, a full desktop. This is not something you're going to SSH into because it's going to sit above your network. So that's something to keep in mind. So let's talk about my parts list. First, you want a Raspberry Pi in some type of case. So I'm using this uh, see-through acrylic case with a nice fan on the top of it. And uh, of course, you're gonna need some ethernet cables. 
and you want to be able to see what's on the screen. Now I can plug this into my computers back here and to get it set up, I might do that if I'm using my controlled hotspot, but you got to remember my van is basically a Faraday box. And uh, because of all the, the sound editing panels that I have in here, uh, which are all wrapped in aluminum foil, my van is a Faraday box. So I need this pie if I'm using uh, if I'm using a signal from the local grocery store, I need this guy to be sitting by a window. So because of that, I have this nice little Raspberry Pi screen. Oop. These screens are, I think I paid maybe, um, maybe 60 bucks for this. I can't remember how much I paid for it. I will find either this screen or a comparable screen to this. Link that in my uh, parts list on the, um, uh, on the tutorial here. And... For simplicity, I also have a micro keyboard. I think these are 20 or 30 bucks on Amazon and they work great. You have a mouse over here, you have your full keyboard buttons over here, everything works. And then I'm actually powering this with my portable battery. Uh, so I have a lith uh, it's, um, actually I think that one is a lithium ion solar generator. You can of course use anything that can power a Raspberry Pi off, which is even like a a portable cell phone charger as long as it has the capability of pushing about three amps. So you can plug all that guy right on in here, turn the system on, set it by the window, and then as long as you have enough ethernet cable to go from your Raspberry Pi into your router, you will be set to go. So there's our concept, there's our parts. Now we're gonna head on over to the Raspberry Pi and show you how to get all the software set up. And then I'm gonna show you this guy, how I have it set up working in action. All right, so we start by just booting up the Pi after adding the Raspberry Pi OS to the uh, SD card. And then um, if you're using the new Pi Imager, you can set all this stuff in the Pi Imager. But since I just downloaded it, now the options will allow us to uh, set up the time zones, the keyboard, and make sure you do change those time zones and the keyboard layouts uh, as I just did here. Because if you don't, you'll be uh, using a wrong keyboard and you'll have to get in there and figure things out. We're going to create our username, so no longer defaults to Pi and Raspberry. So in this case here, we are uh, just creating it, and I'm creating this as a production system, so it has a good desktop here. Mo uh, monitor looks good. And so now we're going to set up the wireless network. And yes, my van's wireless internet is FBI surveillance van, because why not, you know? <laughs> And uh, once we get connected to the network, we have the option here to install updates before we even reboot it the first time. So I'm going to go ahead and install the updates. That took about 20 minutes. And then we're going to restart our Raspberry Pi. Now, here is the guide on setting everything up. And uh, as I said, there are a few typos in the original guide, which is linked, although my particular tutorial is going to have those typos fixed. But I will mention them here. First thing we're going to do is we need to make a configuration change in this file. Now, uh, they give us the wrong file. It's actually Etsy DHC uh, CPCD, and we're going to set the static IP address. Now, the other thing it does not tell us we need to do that we do need to do, and I'm not going to do it here, I'm going to do it in a bit, is we actually have to comment out everything in this file that is not the static IP address. So there's a lot of other stuff in this file that if you do not comment that out, this is going to fail. I'm going to go ahead and keep it not commented out, uh, which is going to fail. That's okay. Now, one of the comments down there says that uh, you might also need to make the similar changes in the dh, uh, DH client.configure uh, file here. Um, in reality, you do not have to do this step. I did it here, but I tested this with and without the interface set up. Um, this is an extra step that uh, I did find in future testing that you did not actually have to do. I decided to keep it in here because the original documentation, somebody commented that this might also be the place where you need to put the static IP address, but it's actually not. I'm just, as I said, including it for um, completion. Now we're going to install the ISC DHCP server. This is going to be the server that allows you to use your Ethernet port as a DHCP server. That means that your, um, your 
uh, Ethernet port will be able to assign an IP address to it uh, based upon the various settings that you're going to do. And you'll see part of this is to start the server and you'll see that it fails to start the server. Okay, that's okay. Now, a lot of that is because we did not comment out everything else in that file. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to do the rest of the configuration first. So we are going to uh, now edit the DHCPD uh, file. And we're going to add these lines. These are setting up the net mask, the range of the automatically assigned IPs, the open broadcast, the routers, the lease times. And it also sets the domain name servers, the DNS servers, which right here is Google. Um, I'm still using, that's the 8888-8844. Those are actually the Google DNS servers. I might actually uh, do away with those or switch it to 1111 because I don't really want it all on the Google servers. But... Uh, for now, that's going to work. That's a configuration change we can make later. All right, we're going to set up uh, the file in the ISC server. All that's in this file is the v4 and the v6 interface. The only thing we're messing with is the v4. We're going to add ETH0. That's going to make the Ethernet port on the Raspberry Pi the DHCP uh, output. So now we're going to... Um, we're going to go ahead and restart the service, but you're going to see it's going to fail. And the reason it's going to fail is uh, all of the rest of the information in that file um, is still in there, in the first file that we edited. Um, so right here, we're going to forward the tables. We can do this at any time. Um, although our final build is going to do this every single time we start the server, but notice the third line there, there's an error um, after the forward is EHT, that should be ETH0. What you're doing here is you're port, uh, port forwarding everything from the wireless to the Ethernet, making the wireless the master and the Ethernet the slave. Um, I know old antiquated language, but sorry, that's what we've done in computers forever. And we're going to go ahead and set one more uh, IP forwarding file in the uh, Etsy syscontrol file. So let's go ahead and add this line to the very bottom, which is going to be our net.ipv4.ip underscore forward equals one. And this is going to set the IPv2 um, to actually forward. Now, the next part here is um, this is going to set your wireless LAN as your default default input. Um, so by default, the Raspberry Pi wants to, if the Ethernet port's connected, that's your primary server. That's going to reverse it so your, your wireless card is your primary server. Again, you'll see it fails. This is because, once again, that original file that we did, DHCPCD, we need to comment out everything else out. And the reason I didn't comment this out first is I wanted to show you that it's going to keep on erroring out until we do this. All right, this is a step that was missing in the original guide that even the corrections that this is the right file to use did not mention that you have to comment out everything else. So until you make those changes, this is not going to work because basically this file is going to be controlling a lot of other things. Now you'll see service is going to start. And of course, the server starts when you get back to your command line and um, everything's working. So this line here, what we're going to do is copy this and we're going to put this into a folder. Now, this original guide puts us in a cron job and the cron job is going to run when it starts so that um, every time you turn the system on, it's going to work. The problem we have is in our setup, we have to do some other steps to make sure we're on the internet first, okay? Um, for example, since we're borrowing free Wi-Fi, oftentimes there's a captive login portal. We have to deal with that captive login portal first. Um, the other thing is you need to modify this file if you are using a VPN. And if I'm using a free publicly available internet, I want to be connecting to a VPN first, and so we're going to make, need to make some changes to that individual file. So what I did is I saved a copy of that file, and that's the type of stuff that would uh, the original guide has us doing uh, on a cron job. We're doing it manually. 
So here we're installing the VPN server. Um, all we're doing is just sudo apt install open VPN. Go ahead and get that installed. And while that is installing, I'm actually downloading the OVPN file from my private VPN. And then all we need to do is we need to uh, call in the um, we need to call in the uh, profile just and we're doing it as a sudo. And what we're doing with the sudo is uh, sudo open VPN and then simply call that profile. And then this is going to have us log in. But the VPN will never get us back to a terminal. So we need to boot up a second terminal to do our next step, which is going to be running our ISC server. But what we'll see here is we'll get our ISC server set up, but it's not going to work. And the reason is our original ISC server is porting everything from the LAN over to the Ethernet. The problem is the LAN is no longer uh, the WAN, excuse me, or the, the WLAN is no longer porting the internet, the VPN is. So I need to go in, copy this file, and we're going to change all instances of WLAN to TUN. Okay, so this is telling it that now we are passing everything from the VPN to the Ethernet port and allowing the VPN port to be our primary source of internet. So what the other thing this is going to do is if the VPN fails, it's going to cut out all access. So my whole system is going to stop passing internet in the event my VPN fails, which is a good fail safe that makes sure I'm not accidentally passing unencrypted data through somebody's free system. So you'll see on my server, on my desktop now, I have a server and I have a server-VPN. Now when I call up the server-VPN, it's going to redirect everything through the tunnel route instead of through the wireless route. And now we are back over onto our network. All right, we can see we are successfully working. My IP matches my um, VPN. Uh, I have my, um, just to monitor and make sure everything's working right, I have my PSSense running over to this monitor. I don't usually do that. And of course, um, internet is not on. We are now feeding through this little blue cable into PFSense. And here is our Raspberry Pi setup. Of course, I have my uh, my networking engineer working heavily on it over here. And uh, we have our little monitor going on. There is the nice little screen. These are like 70 bucks. I'll go ahead and put a link to it down on Amazon. Works great. It actually is just powered directly off of the USB on the Raspberry Pi. And I'm sitting in a parking plaza and there's a McDonald's. Uh, you probably can't see it, but there's a Subway and then there's a Taco Bell. I'm actually borrowing Subway's internet right now. And uh, we are now feeding my entire network. We are pulling down five and up two, which isn't bad for free internet that I can just set here and bridge. So I'm gonna go ahead and boot up Steam and start downloading that game that uh, somebody gifted to me and um, see what it works. All right, so there we have it, guys. Uh, now you can use a Raspberry Pi, borrow internet, Feed a full network system. You could use this for uh, an off-grid situation. You could use it for an emergency situation. You could use it if you have a, a router sitting around and you need to share wireless to devices that don't have wireless ports. Then that's actually the heart of the original uh, tutorial that I borrowed from and, and fixed some of the things with. So with that, guys, thanks for watching. Have a look over the website at uh, switchtolinux.com, and we will see you guys in the next video. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy... Switching to Linux.